Hey everyone. So I'm happy we're joining you from uh, California, and, and I see that uh, I'm actually not driving this robot. So no, uh, no, this is not a self-driving robot. This is a... But I seem to be doing pretty well getting onto the stage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're really excited to have this conversation with you. Okay. So. You. I wanted to start um, a little bit with your history. Uh, you were working on some really interested, uh, interesting and complicated problems at Stanford on the technical side of things like natural language processing. And then you created the platform for MOOCs and went on to build Coursera with your partners. And this, I really feel like this puts you in a unique position to talk about how machine intelligence can and is changing education. So can we start there? Can you expand on that idea, how you've seen it shift things? Sure. So I guess, you know, I had been teaching at Stanford for um, almost a decade by then and I still teach at Stanford. And I think um, similar to other instructors noticed that, you know, year after year, I was walking into the same lecture hall, um, giving this really giving the same lecture, saying the same words, even telling the same jokes <laughs> um, and and um, started the question if that was the best way for us to deliver great service to, 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 to our students. And so um, having worked in AI and machine learning for a long time, I saw the impact of technology on automation and started to wonder if we could, you know, take some lectures and put them online and maybe also create quizzes rather than people create them every single year. And so that wound up uh, turning into Coursera, uh, which, which I'm quite happy, you know, has helped thousands of instructors uh, 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 put courses online at this point. So it seems like you know when you're teaching at Stanford, then you'll have an army of TAs to help you do all the grading and do all the teaching. But when you're doing something like uh, Coursera, it's happening at a completely different scale. And it seems like machine intelligence would have a huge role to play in the scaling out of things like grading and uh, assignments and maybe even providing mentorship and guiding students through the course. Can you talk about you know things you've done or things you're excited about at the interface between those two areas? Yeah, so you know, there is a lot of exciting uh, research work at the intersection of AI and education, ranging from personalized tutors to uh, more intelligent auto graders to custom, uh, customized recommendations and so on. I would say that a lot of that work is in its infancy. Um, I feel like the, the, there was the internet revolution of digitizing content, putting all that online. I feel like we're not, not oh, I'm turning around, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like we're still uh, part way into the process of getting great content online, and this in turn is generating data. So we can look at the data and automatically find out if a quiz is buggy. So, so there's lot, definitely advances, but I think that um, just putting stuff online, there's still a lot of low hanging fruit there, frankly, even more about AI. I think the biggest problem in education today is um, motivation, right? Uh, we know that, um, to really to every one of you in the audience and, and to myself, the impact of education, of continuing lifelong education is profound. But education has almost no short-term rewards. You know, if you spend this weekend studying rather than watching TV on the following Monday, you're not actually that much better at your job. Your boss doesn't know you spend all weekend studying. They're not going <laughs> to patch your back. You have almost no short-term rewards and you missed out on all that TV or whatever. The secret education is um, if you do this not for a weekend, you do this for a year, then you can become really good at something. And so I think one of the biggest challenges in education is providing the scaffolding or the nudges, the motivation to help learners do this thing that actually has a profound impact on, on, on your life and on my life. Do you think there are any interesting advances or directions for that in keeping the motivation of the humans who are involved in this moving forward gamification or um, design mechanisms that would help people be engaged? I don't think any of us have cracked the code yet. I think the gamification work, you know, really uh, badges, points, leaderboards, people are trying out those ideas and they're helping. Um, there's been interesting conversations about, you know, can we design a chatbot so that um, if you, you know, are late on your assignment, maybe the chatbot comes and says, hey, you know, why don't you like, encourage you to continue? Um, I think that we're still in the very early stages um, of how to crack that motivation problem. Um, Maybe not quite an AI solution, but one other uh, solution really that, that I'm quite passionate about is um, uh, with the rise of uh, technological un unemployment. And actually, I think Larry Summers just had an op-ed in the Washington Post, like just, just this week, talking about rising unemployment um, in, in, in men, the working age. Uh, but with rising technological employment, which isn't a recent thing, it's been happening for a long time, um, there's been rising support in Silicon Valley for basic income as well. Uh, and I think with rising unemployment, that will be even more important. 
there's one variation of basic income that I think could really help, um, which is if we pay you not to quote do nothing, but if we pay you to 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 study, right? Somehow, when an 18 year old needs to go to college, we do have a system like Howard Browns and so on to help. So try to help. We need to do more, but at least we're helping. But somehow the 40-year-old is unemployed, um, somehow providing that structure to help them keep studying. So that, and that also increases the chance that they can then return to the workforce, gain the skills they need to return to the workforce and contribute back to this tax base that is paying people to study. I think that might be a future that we need to even look to. And I see, I see some politicians starting to come in with this idea. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean that seems like a like an incredibly uh, exciting idea as a way to rethink education very very broadly. Um, shifting gears a little bit, one of the things that that you said was that uh, you know you you talked about some of the challenges. You know, we I, I asked about AI in in like Coursera, and you talked about the challenge. Well, we're really just even just trying to get the data online, or like it's very early days for thinking about the integration between machine intelligence in this particular area. This is reflective, I think, of, of kind of a larger challenge that it seems like a lot of, uh, that a lot of people are facing in business, for example, where people are trying, you know, there's a lot of great ideas that seem like they're happening in the lab for, uh, for machine learning, but it's really hard to sort of close the gap and understand how to apply those in, in practical business situations. Can you maybe speak about, you know, how you've been thinking about closing the gap in, uh, at, at Baidu and, and in your broader experience? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's really hard. You know, one of the things I'm saying about AI is that um, AI is clear that AI is not about transforming just one industry, right? So um, they're making this analogy that AI is the new electricity. And what I mean by that is um, here in the United States, about 100 years ago, thanks to pioneers like Thomas Edison and a bunch of others and Nikola Tesla and others, uh, we started to build electric power plants in this country and electrification, electricity, transform industry after industry, everything from agriculture, which is transformed by refrigeration, to communications, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to transportation, to manufacturing, you know, industry after industry was transformed by electricity. And I feel like we're now in a position where there is a surprisingly clear path to use AI to transform multiple industries. Um, one of the challenges though, is that it is really hard. So to take the electricity analogy again, when we started to electrify the country, electricity was really complicated. Uh, there were varying voltages. Should you use AC or DC voltage was a thing. Uh, some power plants are more expensive, but more, more reliable. How do you choose your electricity? So companies actually had this role. They would hire someone called the vice president for electricity to manage this incredibly complicated thing called electricity. <laughs> and VP of electricity sounds crazy. I mean, who has a VP of electricity? But it actually made sense back then. I feel like today, AI is so complicated that I see corporations hiring someone to be their VP of AI or the chief AI officer uh, to manage AI for them. Um, you know, as AI matures, it becomes easier to use. Maybe this role will go away, but I think that uh, uh, from, from, from a corporate point of view, this is a um, healthy structure to, to build a team with the AI talent to figure out how to insert this into, into the organization. So at what point do you feel like that is that role is going to go away? Is it is it the point at which AI becomes ubiquitous and sort of reaches the point where it's kind of the same thing as electricity and it's just something that's integral to literally everything you do on a daily basis? Is that something we have to wait for? Yeah, I, actually, I would love for that to happen. Um, I think that uh, today, you know, when, and, and see, like today, right? Um, I, I'm seeing all of you on a TV. I'm not seeing you on my electric TV. That just sounds weird. It's clearly <laughs> an electric TV, right? Uh, uh, and I think uh, in the future, I hope that I don't want to get into my AI self-driving car. I want it to be my car, and I want my car to just take me where, where, where it goes. Like, what's the big deal? This is what a car should be like in the future. So um, the best technology often disappears into the background, right? And, and I don't call you on my smartphone or my mobile phone. It's just my phone. Like, what's the big deal? We all have one of these things. So um, I do see AI increasingly disappearing in the background. You know, I still remember when spam filters were a thing, and none of us think about that. Uh, there was a time when cameras that autofocus on your friend's face was a thing, and now we don't we don't even think about that. Um, and I think, and, and one of the things, one of the exciting things about AI is that I still see a lot of accelerating progress. Right? The 
innovation, the AI ecosystem is extremely open. Those that work on AI, you know, we tend to be simple engineers, and 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 and, and so we we actually like sharing our ideas, and that's creating an ecosystem. And I think I heard uh, uh, Hugo uh, mention this just now. Uh, that's Hugo Larachal, right? Mentioned this ecosystem is continuing to accelerate. So the accelerating progress in AI means that. Um, there's a lot of stuff that isn't going to disappear into the background. We're still inventing new stuff, but I'm also happy that some of the stuff we invented just a few years ago is, is no longer a thing. You just use it, and it was the big deal, and that's a sign of progress. Yeah, so as these kind of things fade into the background, I mean, this is in some ways the history of AI is this moving goalposts, something that uh, seemed like uh, we couldn't achieve it, then eventually we figure out how to, how to solve that problem with computer algorithms, and then it just becomes a tool and stops becoming AI, and then AI becomes something else. Uh, is that a process that you think is eventually going to converge like, to, to something, or, or is, are we just going to be kind of uh, you know, facing Always a kind of a sequence of like, what we kind of call up weak AIs that just become cars? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, for what it's worth, um, I think these weak AIs have a long ways to go. Um, most of AI today is relatively simple. We're good at you know, uh, uh, inputting something and outputting something. Right? Input an email, tell me if it's spam or not. In input a picture of what's in front of your car, tell me you know, what's the safe way to drive the car. Um, but it turns out that this formula of learning input and outputs, the technical term is supervised learning, this is enough to transform a lot of industries. Um, input a loan application, tell me if I should apply or deny this loan application, that will transform consumer finance. And so the the we're so far from human level intelligence. Um, those of us that work on deep learning sometimes make an analogy to the human brain, but frankly, we have pretty much no idea, right? almost completely no idea how the human brain works. And so our realms are really almost nothing like the brain, but despite their simplicity and despite the fact that there are a lot of problems and they need so much data to learn, uh, this, this, this thing we have is already enough to transform industries. There's so much progress, I hope for additional, so I do see a clear shot today to transform multiple industries. And then actually Sushi Sari just now talked about healthcare. I spent a lot of time in healthcare myself and it's surprisingly, the roadmap is becoming clear for how AI will transform healthcare. Um, but there's a, one of the challenges of AI is when you speak of reporters, it's hard to explain this very high goal, which is we will transform industry after industry. But it isn't so hard that I think we can build a robot that can do everything a human can, and maybe with an evil killer AI or whatever. So I think the, the, the broader, broader public is a nuanced message that we're very high sight, transform multiple industries, but not so high as to risk these evil killer robots or whatever and some of the, the popular spheres. So a moment ago, you talked about the, the exponential growth in this area. And, and one of the things that exponential growth, especially in technology, does is it creates and exacerbates inequalities. Do you see a way for us to think about these systems and start building these systems in a way that will allow us to avoid the creation of those inequalities or, or ameliorate them? Yeah, you know, I think that... Um, uh, I, 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 there's an answer that I feel very deeply about. Um, it sounds a bit simple, but but I'll say it, which is which is I think it comes down to education. I think our society has become remarkably good at giving opportunities to um, uh, people with the skills to do you know important work, and there's a lot of important work in our society to be done, and um, uh, demand for talent is vastly outstrips supply in many, many areas. Um, and so, so long as people have the right education, there are plenty of opportunities in our society. So I think the challenge is how to structure you know, society uh, so that so as to best match people to the critically needed roles, the really important work that needs to be done. Um, there is this fear of uh, technological labor displacement, like self-driving cars, putting all the truck drivers out of jobs, and, you know, and, and so on. Um, this type of technological displacement has been happening for decades. You know, as, as early as when uh, we started building tractors to automate a lot of farming, a lot of farming jobs went away. Right. Um, the challenge back then. Um, and uh, I think this book, uh, The Second Machine Age, that this is tremendous um, um, exposition of these uh, uh, issues. Um, the, the, the challenge back then was that um, if a farming job went away, you know, the farmer could maybe work until retirement, but the children had to go to a different school system to learn a different trade, like go to services or manufacturing services. One of the challenges we see today is that the AI technological displays is coming so quickly that people that are alive today, rather than just their descendants, might need to be reskilled for a different job. Um, so I personally think that um, scalable forms of education, be it massive open online 
causes or something, you know, uh, has to be a huge piece of the solution. I don't think the massive open online courses that, that, that we have today, you know, Coursera, edX, Udacity, or Udemy, or Linda.com, and so on, um, I think they will be a huge piece of solution, but there is still something missing. And um, possibly universal basic income, but where we pay you to study, that could be a big piece of solution. Um, I think that there's still stuff to figure out. And, and frankly, I think that the more that um, leaders in you know, government and, and corporate industry think about the real issue, which is technological labor displacement, and, 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 and waste less time thinking about evil killer robots enslaving the human race, I think the more likely uh, uh, we will be to, to come, come to the types of solutions we need. So Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It was really fascinating. Thank you. <laughs>